God's blessing on them. And it was growing. This was the church of Acts chapter 2. And this can be the church of 2023 in Mount Cop. I believe it. Because we have the same God. But these early Christians' responsibility, whilst they were there standing, they just had to stand there. It was a crane that was holding the bus, wasn't it? We have a responsibility for these four things in verse 42. And then the Lord, who holds the bus, it's his responsibility to add to his church daily those who are being saved. I'm bringing these two messages because God has put on my heart that if we are to be a community church reaching our communities for Jesus, then we ourselves must be a community of believers, tight-knit, a family, loving one another, devoted to fellowship and these other things as well. And as such, we're considering what the early church, which should surely be an example to us, how they lived as a community of Christians in Acts chapter 2. Did they have a complicated business-like strategy, how to grow the church? Did Peter and James and John meet with a flip chart and draw graphs and draft in consultants as to how they grow the church? No. It was quite simple. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, their fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers. The Holy Spirit used that, and the Lord grew the church. Um, thank you, church, for giving financially here because um, you paid for me and G to go on a conference last year. I don't know if you knew that, but you did. And uh, we went to the FIEC Leaders Conference. So all the pastors and uh, church leaders and deacons and youth workers and women in ministry were there. And um, I went to a um, seminar about small churches. I thought, that's quite apt. We'll go there. And it was fantastic. And I was challenged there not to focus on the size of the church, but to focus on the health of the church. And then the size looks after itself. Are we as a church sticking to these basic ingredients that the church in Acts 2 did? Those basic ingredients there in verse 42. And of course, this isn't the sum total of everything they did. You know, they had a welfare program a little bit later on in Acts, didn't they? Of course, there was evangelism. Of course, it was the Holy Spirit doing the work. But these are the simple ingredients in verse 42. Last week, we considered um, the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. And so this week, you've guessed it, we're going to look at the breaking of bread and the prayers. So, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. If you don't have a Bible, you've probably memorized it by now. But let's say it out loud all together. Or have a go if you haven't got a Bible. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. The breaking of bread. What was it? Well, bread was and is a staple food. Now, in those days, um, it wouldn't be like Warburton's lovely loaf, you know, this high and nice and squidgy, which if you put wrong in your shopping basket, it's squashed (laughs) irretrievably. Their bread was quite flat. It was about an inch thick, um, round or oblong, and about six or seven inches wide. They didn't cut it. They broke it. So to break bread, it was just a normal turn of phrase to have food. Now, we see this in Luke chapter 24 and verse 30, where it's, uh, Jesus has, has risen from the dead. He's appeared to those two um, people on the road to Emmaus. And Luke chapter 24 and verse 30, they've had this big, long walk, haven't they? They've got to where they wanted. And when he was at table with them, Jesus, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. It was just a normal meal. They weren't having some particular rite or um, ceremony. They were just breaking bread. They were having some food at the end of the day. So what was this? Well, it was an ordinary meal, quite perhaps. 
And verse 46 of Acts chapter 2 says this, that day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. What was this? The breaking of bread was shared meals and hospitality. Not necessarily some big fancy thing or ceremony. They're breaking bread. I suppose the equivalent would be, you know, what's a standard thing? It's not food, but, you know, having a cuppa. You know, it's just a, just a standard thing. They're breaking bread together. It was hospitality. Now, if you remember, at Pentecost, lots of Jewish people had to come, didn't they, to the city. And we read um, last week in, in chapter 2 that there were Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from weird places that we've never heard of. And it all gathered. They weren't in their homes. They were temporarily staying there. So it was so important that those um, early believers who did live there opened up their homes and they shared what they had. They shared hospitality. They shared their food because a lot of these people weren't at home. They were traveled to Jerusalem. Some of you have a special gift of hospitality. And I'm so thankful for that. And the Church of Jesus ought to be known for its hospitality. These early Christians devoted themselves to breaking bread together. Now, it's quite likely that the breaking of bread refers to just normal meals. Having a sarni, you know, together. However, we know that the early church incorporated at the end of each meal something that we now know as the Lord's Supper. So, what was it? It's probably a little bit of both, actually. So, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, well, months ago, we had our fellowship lunch, and then at the end, we took communion at the end, didn't we? Similar sort of thing the early church did. Breaking of bread became a term that was used for taking the bread and wine, like Jesus taught, um, in the upper room. And we can see that in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, where Paul is on his, one of his missionary journeys. And on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them. The church had got into a kind of rhythm where each week they, they took the Lord's Supper, communion, um, the Eucharist, whatever you want to call it. So breaking the bread is a term for that. If you've been in a brethren assembly before, you'll know that the, the morning service is often called the breaking of bread because they make it central to what they do. People might share a psalm or, you know, something that God's put on the heart, but central to what they do is breaking bread. <clears throat> now, in this early church, they were doing it day by day, weren't they? We read that in verse 46. They were doing it in one another's homes. They didn't need a priest to come and transform their usual food into the actual body and blood of Jesus. That is not what Jesus taught. So if, if that's something you're not sure about, if we turn to Matthew chapter 26, um, you know, in some traditions it's taught that when the wafer touches the tongue, it becomes the body of Christ, or, you know, when some blessing is said, like, changes to actually become flesh and blood. When Jesus inaugurated the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, he said in verse 26, take and eat, this is my body. And so from that, some people think, well, therefore, it must actually literally be Jesus' body. But look at the context. Jesus was there bodily, wasn't he? So He's not saying that this bread attached to him. He said, this is my body, while he was bodily there. Which to me implies, it's not a literal thing. Jesus also said, I'm the door. Doesn't mean that he's a piece of wood that swings on a hinge. It's a metaphor, isn't it? We don't represent Jesus' body on an altar when we take the Lord's Supper. Um, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10 says this. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. One time was enough for all people, 
for all sins that you could ever commit for all time. So the Lord's Supper, that's what breaking the bread was. Also, sharing a meal. So we read, though, that they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Why did they devote themselves to that? Well, just speaking about meals generally, um, Romans chapter 15 and verse 7 says this, that we are to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us. How did Christ welcome you? Did he say, hey, up, Heather, you're right? No. Jesus' welcome was deep and, and costly and personal. And meaningful. Jesus' welcome with outstretched arms on the cross, wasn't it? Thus was Jesus' welcome. With all of his life welcoming you into his family when you put your trust in him. So when we had to welcome one another as Christ welcomed us, it's got to be more than, hey up. (laughs) It should be intimate, shouldn't it? With my brothers and sisters, I should welcome you. Now, this is something I'm not good at. As a pastor, I'm called to be given to hospitality, is what the Bible says. And I'm not really in a routine of doing that. So you can hold me accountable, dear church. I've already asked Chris to do this. I'd like to aim to have everybody back to our house for lunch at least once this year, possibly twice, if you're good. (laughs) We should be given to hospitality. I should as a pastor, but we should all welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us. And that's why they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. But also... Thinking about the Lord's Supper specifically, why did they devote themselves to it? Well, it's important. It was so important that the Lord's Supper was the first meal taken on the moon. Did you know that? So um, you had um, Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. They were up there. And when they'd flown there and they landed their craft, they had a couple of hours to sort of recoup and regather before they opened the door and stepped out. And one of the things that Buzz Aldrin, who was an elder of a Presbyterian church, wanted to do was when he got to the moon, take the Lord's Supper. And so you can look on Google and find a picture of a little chalice that he took, uh, that he took bread and wine in. He thought it was important on the moon. It should be important to us. We should devote ourselves to it because to do so is to obey what Jesus commanded. Jesus gave two proper ordinances to the church. And the first of which we've already read in Acts chapter 2, where in verse 41, where it says that those who received the word of Peter the apostle preaching were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. These people had already been baptized in water as a display of what Jesus had done in them, in their trust in the gospel. And then they went on to share the Lord's Supper together. I wonder, have you been baptized in water? As part of our obedience to Jesus, as is taking the Lord's Supper. But also, they devoted themselves to it because we have a need to look, and I'm going to put all of them on the screen, to look these ways. I need to look back. Is there a particular meal that if you're served it, it really evokes memories? Oh, so, so for me, um, if I have, you know those hot dogs in a tin, are they called ye old oak or something, that you put in boiling water? They're not really hot dogs, are they? <laughs> I don't know what they are. But whenever I have those, that evokes such a strong memory of me, of going to Ross on Sea in Wales, where my dad... First, my granddad and then my dad would, would cook us some sausages in the camping stove on the beach. We'd throw stones at tin cans and we'd have hot dogs. So whenever I have hot dogs, it makes me, brings back that memory of that. And Jesus gave us a meal to look back and remember. When, get the timeline in your head. You've got the, um, the early church and the day of Pentecost here. How far before that was Jesus um, crucified and raised? Mathematicians, Bible scholars. 
Well, Pentecost is 50, so 50 days after the events. In other words, Jesus had only been dead and raised a few weeks, but they still felt the need to remember. That's interesting, isn't it? Because we so often forget. If they had the need to remember, how much more do we? We don't need to repeat Jesus' sacrifice, it's once for all, but we need to remember and relish it. And we do that through taking the Lord's Supper. So we look back, we look outward. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Excuse me. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to ask somebody in a loud voice to read verses 17 to 20. And as they read, I want you to see if you can spot any phrases that repeat themselves. Could somebody read 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 20 out loud, please? Thank you, Soup. Thank you. That, that's it, Sue. And I'm going to read verse 33 to 34. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I will give directions when I come. Did you see a phrase that repeated itself? Yes. Jeans hit the nail on the head. Come together. In the ESV, five times we've just read it, in, in as many verses. In the Lord's Supper, we look outwards to one another, to my sister, to my brother. We come together. The Lord's Supper isn't just a private dinner date with Jesus. It is a family meal. And as such, whilst I'm sure Buzz Aldrin had a good intention... Really, it's not communion unless you share it with other believers. And, you know, as a family meal, it binds together. One of those things that um, perhaps family counselors will say, uh, make sure you eat together daily. You've probably heard that, haven't you? Sit down around the table together. Because when you eat together, it does pull you in, doesn't it? So we look outward at one another, and we're reminded that we are a family. In the Lord's Supper, we look inward because we're given an opportunity to examine our hearts in light of the gospel. Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 11 about eating worthily. Now, the idea isn't that if you are not completely perfect, then you can't take the bread and the wine. That's not the point, because none of us are. We all have sin in our life somewhere. But are we keeping short accounts of the Lord? Are we living in hypocrisy? Are we... um, at, you know, out of joint with a brother or a sister in the church. It's a chance to examine our heart and look inward. And finally, to look forward, like we're reminded on this table here. We take communion until he comes. Um, I quite like cooking, and I did a little bit of cooking early morning, puts it in the slow cooker, and now the house is filled with an aroma. Hopefully it's nice, <laughs> hopefully, because uh, Heather and James are having it later. But um, there's anticipation, isn't there, in a meal? Or if you're baking a cake, uh, I know there's raw eggs sometimes and you're not meant to, but you still lick the spoon, don't you? And there's, there's anticipation of what will come when it comes finally out of the oven. And so this meal is anticipatory. It, we look forward. Jesus said that he wouldn't drink again of the fruit of the vine until he comes into the kingdom. Matthew 26, 29. And when he does come in his kingdom, Ezekiel 45 says that we'll celebrate that again with him. So that's why they devoted themselves to the Lord's Supper. What about us? How can we devote ourselves in this way? Well, can I encourage you to share meals? Show hospitality over food. 
when was the last time that you invited somebody from church back to your house? Now, it doesn't have to be fancy, does it? What food were they sharing? Bread. <laughs> They're breaking bread. That it wasn't a three-course meal. It wasn't the finest steak or whatever presented and fantastic Staffordshire porcelain. Although I do like that. So if, if we do come to your house, then please. Um, but, you know, sometimes hospitality can... We can use it as a chance to show off, can't we? And, and examine your heart, you know. If, if your house isn't tidy, are you like, sorry, you can't come? Or if things aren't particularly dead on, are you like, oh, I'm so sorry. Da, 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 da. It doesn't really matter, does it? At the end of the day, it's not so much about the food. It's about sharing together. So I'd encourage you, invite somebody back to yours. Maybe even for a piece of bread. Or if you struggle with food, get a takeaway. Some of you, that would be difficult because the home situation isn't easy. You know, maybe your spouse isn't a Christian or there's some other difficulty. Well, go out and have food together. It's the same thing, really, isn't it? So, um, can I encourage you to show hospitality over food? And, and secondly, specifically about the Lord's Supper, think about how we often take it. I'm going to criticize the way that we do it. I'm sorry. Because in what other meal do you eat with people, but you never look at them? In fact, you're all looking at one way. The only place I can think of is in front of the telly. And that's hardly a good example of, of how to have a meal, is it? So can I suggest that next time we take communion, we do so communally. We look each other in the eye. You know, we might share it over lunch. We might turn the chairs around. Maybe. You know, because it's something that we share together, isn't it? It is with the Lord, but it is also with his family. And here are some questions to ask as you take the Lord's Supper. Have, you turn, have I turned from my sin and trusted Jesus' sacrificial death for me? Have I identified with Jesus and his people through baptism? Have I committed myself to the local church? Am I currently walking in fellowship with Jesus and his family? And finally, before we move on to the prayers, um, on Monday, Thursday, we're having somebody come and bring a Seder meal, which is similar to the Passover meal that Jesus would have had. We'll share food, and then he's going to take us through the different elements that the Jewish people have on their Passover meal. And we'll see the significance of that. So put that in your mental diary, Monday, Thursday evening. They were devoted to the breaking of bread, and they were devoted to the prayers. What were they? Well, that seems obvious, doesn't it? Prayers are prayers. Notice so that it doesn't say they devoted themselves to prayer. They devoted themselves to the prayers. These early Christians still attended the temple times of prayer. We saw that in verse 46. Day by day, they attended the temple. And in Acts chapter 3 and verse 1, Peter and John go up to the temple at the hour of prayer, at the ninth hour, or 3 p.m. So these early Christians were still going to the temple. And it says, the prayers, probably because it talks about specific times of prayer that they'd set aside. These were the prayer meetings of the church, either in the temple or maybe in Brother, Brother Levi's home or Sister Miriam's home. They're like, okay, we're going to meet for prayer at this time. These were the prayers, corporately gathered together. And even if not a massive show, at least a few of them praying together. Because that's what we've seen, hasn't it? Haven't we? All of these things have been done communally. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread. And prayers, too, are to be done together. That's not to say that you should not pray at home. Of course you should. Jesus said, shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in secret. But he also commanded us to pray together. Because where two or three are gathered in his name, you know the same. Why did they devote themselves 
to prayer. Well, very quickly, because Jesus devoted himself to prayer. Jesus had a big decision. He spent time in prayer. He prayed through the night on occasions. He cut short preaching tours so that he could pray. Why did they devote themselves to prayer? To be strong against the devil. Ephesians 6 verse 18 says that. Why did they pray and devote themselves to it? Because prayer pleases God. In Revelation 8, 3 to 4, we have this picture of the prayers of the saints being offered like incense spiritually to God. So when he smells it, it's a sweet perfume to him when his people pray. Why did they devote themselves to prayer? Because prayer opens gospel doors. Do you know that the first time that the gospel was preached and received in the whole continent of Europe was at a prayer meeting? Acts chapter 16 says this. Lydia and some of her friends go down to the river where they pray and Paul shares the gospel. And Lydia was the first convert in Europe. Why did they pray and devote themselves to it? Well, through prayer, God gives us direction. In Acts chapter 13, uh, the people there at um, Antioch, I think, are praying together. And the Holy Spirit says, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. It was while they were praying. And finally, why do we pray and devote ourselves to it? Prayer changes six. It changes you. It changes me. And it changes situations. Not because I'm so great and strong to hold you up the bus. <laughs> Thank you, Beth, for that illustration that is going to come back to haunt me. Um, <laughs> but, but because we pray to an awesome God. And we pray together. If you hear one violin playing alone, it can be nice. But if you hear a whole orchestra tuned to the same key, playing in the same rhythm, it's beautiful, isn't it? And so is prayer together. So how can we, Malcott Community Church, devote ourselves to the prayers? I wonder if we ceased to pray on a Sunday and on a Wednesday, if anything would change. If nothing would change, to me, that's a problem because we're not relying on prayer, are we? Well, let me encourage you to pray in those formal times of prayer during the service. Um, come out on a Wednesday to pray with us. And if Wednesdays don't work for you, but you want to pray together, then tell me and we'll find a day that does. Or we could do it on Zoom. Let us pray together and devote ourselves there too. Maybe you feel... I can't pray very eloquently. Well, do you know that most of the prayers in the Bible are to the point? Dear Lord, da -da 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 -da. this is this, thank you, amen. That kind of thing. They're not vast. There are some longer prayers, but most of them are to the point. Don't feel intimidated. Remember that you pray to God, not to Matt, not to Chris, not to whoever else. You pray to God. And remember that everybody has to start somewhere. I remember when I became a Christian at Melton Baptist Church, and we pray around in a circle. So, you know, when the person to the right of you says amen, it's your cue to go. And I, my heart would be pounding, because I thought, I'm going to have to pray next. And I remember um, Will Campbell, some of you know Will, and he kind of pulled me to one side afterwards and gave me a little word of wisdom. And I can't remember his exact words, but they were something like, you don't need to pray for ages and ages. Don't feel intimidated or the pressure to do that. God hears. Just pray. <laughs> so, in conclusion, whose responsibility was it to add to the church? The Lord's. The Lord added to the church daily, such as were being saved. That's his responsibility. Our responsibility is to be who he calls us to be. And part of that is devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Over the past year or so, we've been stripped back somewhat as a church, haven't we? So this is a great opportunity to make sure we have a good foundation to build on. 
for the Lord to build them because he builds his church. Let's not be com- concerned so much with size as we are with health. And let us be faithful in what God has called us to be and leave the results to Jesus. We'll play our part. We'll stand there with our arms in the the air for as long as he calls us to do. But know that he's the one who'll (laughs) shoulder the burden, who'll carry the weight. And he is the one, he says, he is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. Take some time just quietly to meditate. And then, as the Lord leads, uh, let's pray. Uh, Let's a few of us pray. Maybe you've been challenged to pray out loud this morning and you never have.